Well, I want you to think with me just for a moment about the worst storm you have ever been in. I'm talking about a real storm. Maybe it was a tornado that brought great devastation all around you. Or maybe it was a hurricane. Or maybe it was a snowstorm or a blizzard. I want you to imagine with me what it would feel like in the midst of that devastating storm to be able to look up and see a rainbow. A rainbow is a beautiful thing. A rainbow is a picture of hope. We all know a rainbow is an optical phenomenon that causes spectrum of light to appear in the sky when the sun shines through droplets of moisture. And while that is a technical definition, what we really know is when we see a rainbow, it gives us hope. I believe if you could see a rainbow in the midst of a terrific storm, you would know that the sun is going to come out. Like Annie says, tomorrow, bet your bottom dollar, the sun's going to come out. I like the picture of a rainbow. A rainbow is always something good, something that brings us hope. A good friend, Christy, last night saw on Facebook that I was going to talk on this topic, and she sent me something. She said, do you know what rainbow babies are? And I had never heard of rainbow babies. And she said, a rainbow baby is a miracle baby conceived after the loss of another child. The devastation of the loss, the hardship of that storm, and then a baby comes along, and that gives comfort, and that gives hope. Things are going to be okay. Now, you and I know storms can be much more than just the weather. It is certainly a storm when you get a pink slip on your job after working faithfully there for decades. It's a storm when you get a call from the doctor telling you that the cells are abnormal and the cancer is spreading and you're going to need surgery right away. It's a storm when the love of your life leaves, either by death or by choice, and you realize you've got to navigate the future alone. It's a storm when one's retirement is wiped out by a failing economy right before you need to start drawing from that retirement to live on. It's a storm when a parent dies. It is a storm when a child dies. It is a storm when a precious pet dies. Y'all, for over 30 years I've been a pastor and I have listened to adults talk about their storms and I have walked through my share of storms. And it has taken me a long time to realize in each of these storms there is a rainbow. There is something, if we could only grasp, that would give us hope even in the most difficult of circumstances. I want to talk about that today seeing the rainbow in your storm. But before we do that, I want to kind of give you some parameters or give you some thoughts that I think will help you just a little bit. The first thing I want you to do is don't ever equate your storm with something God is doing to you. Please understand the Bible says God came to give life. God is a God of love. Jesus said it is the enemy who comes to kill, steal, and destroy. So many people think when a storm approaches, they think God is angry at me. God is mad at me. God is getting even with me. God is punishing me. Something has to be wrong with me. I must be out of God's will because he is doing these things to me. Please get this. God doesn't cause those problems, but he certainly uses them for his good. I cause most of the problems I've experienced in my life. I cause them for me. And if you're truthful, many, I'm pretty sure, Warren, you cause many of your problems. There's a few of us I just know. I just know. <laughs> me and Warren, Santa Steve and Bert, there's a few, well, Freddie and Randy and Joe and Joe, everybody really, I guess, here. Everybody here. We cause many of our problems, but he can use them for good. Other people certainly cause problems. There's evil in society that causes problems. Just the world in general causes problems. Nature sometimes causes problems. And it doesn't really matter why or who caused the problems in life. Regardless of the source, God wants to use the storm for his good. He wants to take this bad thing that is happening to you and he wants to turn it. And he wants to turn it in such a way that with spiritual eyes you can say, I see his rainbow in the storm. I see what I'm supposed to see in the midst of the storm. 
You've heard me say many times, anybody can bring good out of good, but it is only God who brings good out of bad. And he does it every single day. Today I want us to look at five ideas, five thoughts around storms and try to get our arms around when it's taking place, God is wanting to show you in a rainbow something he is wanting to do in your life and he's wanting to do in my life. Before we dive into that, though, look at the scripture on the screen. This is 1 Peter chapter 4. I love this. Friends, when life really gets difficult, in other words, the storms are raging, don't jump to the conclusion that God isn't on the job. Instead, be glad that you're in the very thick of what Christ experienced. This is a spiritual refining process. Circle that. I like that spiritual refining process with glory just around the corner. Now, that's a modern paraphrase, but that is a beautiful thought. Don't throw in the towel and think God's not at work when storms are happening. No, God is using that storm as a spiritual refining process to help you become who you need to become. It'll end for glory for you. It's going to be a great deal. Just hang in there. I say again, God doesn't enjoy you going through problems. He's not a cosmic killjoy that wants to dump on you. But he is a God who says, I will use those bad things happening to you to create in you a better person than you ever dreamed. Well, let's let's jump in and write this down, please. I see a rainbow in the storm when I realize God can use storms to direct me. I can see rainbows in the storm when I realize God can use storms to direct me. In other words, to point me in a new direction to point me on a different path. Sometimes storms are necessary for us to go a different direction, a better direction. Have you ever noticed that sometimes storms will make you change your plans? Storms will sometimes make you change your plans. Look at Proverbs 20. Proverbs 20 says this, sometimes it takes a painful experience to make us change our ways. Can anybody ever say, I've experienced that? Something very painful in my life has made me change my ways. Would you raise your hand? Uh, That's a true statement. It is that huge storm that you find yourself in where you say, I quit. I don't want to go down this path ever again. You've heard me say this many times. Look at it on the screen. You may want to write this down. We don't change when we see the light. We often change when we feel the heat. The heat of something in life that's tough a pain that's coming upon us, and we say, we don't want this pain anymore. Aristotle said it like this, we only learn through pain. There's a lot of truth there. We only learn through pain. Sometimes it's a storm of our own making. You know the parable Jesus told of the prodigal son? I think it's most people's favorite story in the Bible. Jesus says there once was a father, and the son said, Dad, I want my inheritance right now. I know you're living, but I don't really care about that. I want my money now. The father gave him his money, and he went out, and he just blew it. I mean, he was living high. He was, he was at the clubs. He was drinking and, and women and wine. And I'm sure if, if they had had cocaine, it had been cocaine. It had been a whole bit. He was living large, and one day the money was gone. And he didn't have anything to eat. And he didn't have any real friends because they weren't with him. If he didn't have money, nobody was hanging out with him. And he found himself. Now, he's a Jewish guy because Jesus is telling the story, Jewish culture. The guy ends up living in a pig pen, there's nothing lower in the Jewish mindset than that, living in a pig pen, and he is eating the food thrown to the pigs. This guy's at the bottom. But what does the Bible say? Then he came to himself. Then he came to himself and said, I don't want to live like this anymore. I bet you can remember a time in your life where you said, I don't want to live like this anymore. Some of you can go back to maybe not the too distant past and you can say, I was in that pig pen. I was sleeping on that sofa. I was sleeping in that back bedroom. I was, I was doing the drugs. I was wasting my life. I was involved in that relationship that was, that was horrible. I was stealing the money. I was treating people. I was wherever I was. I realized this is bad. I don't want to live like this anymore. And God used the storm you were in in that moment to give you direction. That's a great place to be. 
One of the benefits of a bad storm is it doesn't leave you where you were. It picks you up and takes you to somewhere else. So you could be in a bad storm, and God may just be wanting to use that in your life to give you a pivot point, a place for you to say, I was going this way. I don't want to go this way anymore. I'm going this way. I never will forget. And I don't hope you don't get tired of me saying this. I never will forget. Ethan, out on the street, I didn't know where he was, didn't know what he was doing. His mother and I were just heartbroken, didn't know what was going on in his life. We just knew he was having to figure it out. And he called me one morning and he said, Dad, I am sick and tired of my life. I'll do whatever you say. Help point me in the right direction. I am tired of the way I'm going. You understand? Yeah, that's, that deserves a hand clap when it happens for anybody. You may want to write this down. We only change when our fear of change is exceeded by our pain. We only change when our fear of change is exceeded by our pain. Nobody really wants to change. We kind of like where we are. We're kind of in our deal. We're kind of, you know, doing our thing. But there comes a point for many of us when the storm gets so big, the pain gets so severe that we say, I don't want this anymore. The Apostle Paul was writing to a group of friends that had had to go through a painful situation. And this is what Paul said in 2 Corinthians. He said this, I'm glad, not because it hurt you, but because the pain turned you to God. I'm glad, not because it hurt you, but because the pain turned you to God. Give you another perspective. One of my favorite stories in the Bible is of the, the prophet Elijah. Elijah went through some real tough stuff, and God said, I'm going to take care of you. And Elijah was led to a little brook, beautiful little serene place, and God created this wonderful atmosphere for him just to kind of relax and rest. And God fed him, and he was able to sleep, and the brook was wonderful. And then the Bible says these words, then the brook dried up. You ever been in a situation in your life where that wonderful place that you were suddenly dried up? Well, Elijah did what many times we do. God, what's up? I, I, I like the brook. I like this spa-like life that I'm living. I like the luxury of where I am right now. Why did you do this? And we later understand it's because God had another plan for him. God was leading him. God was going to use this painful situation to direct him to the next leg of his life and where he was supposed to be. Let me give you a personal story. Went through a divorce in 1987. My fault, stupid, young, kid, dumb. Y'all been there, many of you know, just, just dumb. And so, um, and I had been a pastor, I'd been a young pastor, and I'd walked away from being a pastor and, and didn't know exactly what I was going to do. I had a little bit of money, money was beginning to, to slowly slip away, and I'm trying to think, what can I do, what can I do? And finally, I, I networked with an old friend of mine, and he hooked me up with a company in Dallas, Texas, called Sabbath Stewardship Ministries. It was a church fundraising company, and I went out to Dallas and interviewed, and they said, you're just what we want. I was with them for three days. And they were going to pay me twice what I was making as a pastor. And I was making fair as a pastor for way back then. And they were going to pay me twice that. And so I'm thinking, this has got to be it. This is, this is it. This is, this is going to be wonderful. And I had one little problem. I had two sons. Uh, Ray was about six or seven, and Ethan was three or four. And so I was going to a little church, and they were having a little uh, camp out. And if y'all can believe this, I got me a little pup tent, and I took the boys to this little camp out. And I was going to tell them that I'm going to be moving to Dallas, Texas. But you know how you can work stuff out in your brain to kind of make it all fit? And I had it all figured out. I'd be making enough money, and, and Dallas is, um, Atlanta's an airport hub, so I'd be coming through Atlanta, and I'd be able to see the boys. And I had all this stuff worked out. And So I'm, I'm telling the boys, and Ethan's too young to know. He's just, he's chasing butterflies. He doesn't know what's going on. He just doesn't care. But as I'm telling Ray the story, and I'm selling, guys, I am selling my son. I'm selling him that I'm moving. Chris, I'm moving to Texas, and it's going to be, they're going to be able to come to Texas and visit me, and I'll be able to fly into Atlanta about every week or two, and I'll be able to see them. And big tears began to come down his cheeks. And he said, Dad, don't leave us. Don't leave us. And I'm selling harder and harder and harder, and I'm realizing great. This ain't going to work. This ain't going to work. And so I called and said, the Monday when it came around, I said, I can't do it. I can't do it. So then I'm stuck. I don't know what to do. I ended up getting a job selling insurance and investments, which I wasn't very good at. And, and I did that and kind of floundered around. 
instead of getting away from where I had kind of embarrassed myself, which was in this area, I mean, South Atlanta, I wanted to get away from South Atlanta. It's like I wanted to go to the other part of the world and just kind of start over. I had to stay right here. But you know what happened? God began to deal with me right here. I began to share my situation, my struggles with other people, many who didn't go to church, and they began to relate to me. I began to talk about how God was teaching me things, and I didn't know what it was, but people who didn't have a church background began to resonate. A few years went by, started the village church. Many of those people started and were the first people to become a part of our church family. My point is, God used a storm, the storm of not getting to take the job that I thought I was going to get to take to direct me to where I needed to be all along. I say again, there's a rainbow in your storm. Sometimes God is trying to direct you, and you need to take a step back and say, what might it be? Write this down. Under each point, I want to give you just a question. I want you to to just write down and think about, where is this storm leading me? Where is this storm leading me? Where is this storm leading me? Number two, I see the rainbow in the storm when I realize God uses problems sometimes to inspect me. God uses storms sometimes to inspect In other words, God wants me to go through some struggles. When I'm going through them, he wants to use that as a time for me to look inside my heart to see who I really am. Do you know God is more interested in your character than he is in your comfort? He really could care two hoots about how big your television is. He could care two hoots really about the size of your car. He could care two hoots about the vacation, level of vacation you're able to enjoy. What he wants more than anything is your character to be character like his character, good, strong, solid character. Proverbs 16, 2 says this, humans are satisfied with whatever looks good, but God probes for what is good. You see, a lot of times we'll go through life and we can look good, but we go through those storms and suddenly we have to look inside and say, is what I'm portraying really me? What's good? Y'all remember the story about the Hebrew children All the people, uh, followers of God, the Jews, they had been in captivity in Egypt. Moses led them out of Egypt. They go to what's called the wilderness. There they are given the Ten Commandments. They're in the wilderness. They should have been in the wilderness just a few weeks before they went to the Promised Land. The distance is not far. But you know how long they stayed in the wilderness? Anybody remember? Forty years. They just kept having to take another lap. One more lap. Now, how many of you can relate to what I'm saying? Sometimes we just take another lap because we haven't learned what we need to learn about the situation we're in. Any of you know what I mean? I I know, y'all. There have been times in my life where it's like, I just completed the same stupid thing again. I just went around the deal one more time because I had never thought God wanted me to inspect myself, look on the inside, see who I really was, learn who I was way down deep, and then change those things that were wrong, change those things that were hurting me, begin to make decisions differently. I like this. Look on the screen. All of us are a lot like tea bags. To see what's inside of us, you've got to put us in hot water. When we get in hot water, suddenly what's inside of us comes out of us. And oftentimes it takes a long time for us to realize what we are seeing is who we really are. God is saying, is that what you want? Is what's coming out of you what you want to come out of you? He uses storms to inspect me. And that's important. God, through times of suffering, works on what's inside of me. Write this down. What does this storm reveal about me, the storm you're in? What does the storm reveal about you? Once again, I have, I have a friend. I have a good friend. And he is so afraid he's going to die alone. He is so afraid he's going to die alone. But he is poison in almost every relationship he has. He is, he is arrogant and he is, he is uh, bossy and he is, he is um, just, it's hard. It's hard to hang out with him. It's hard. So, you know, he keeps going through the same deal. 
keeps getting rejected, keeps having women run from him. And it's like, why is God doing this to me? And it's like, you're going to keep having the same thing happen until you look in the mirror. See what's going on in your heart. Change. Listen, I, I, had, some, I had some relationship failures, but you know why? It's because I needed to change. There were some things in me that needed to change. So finally, after the upteenth time of just going around the same wilderness territory again and again and again, it's like ding, ding, ding. Oh, I, I get it. I get it. You know what happened? I was able to get off of that lap. I was able to move out of that situation. I was able to move on in my life. Some of y'all are still taking the same lap you should have been finished with 30 years ago. Listen, what storm are you in right now? What, think about what is it? What is it? And then ask yourself, could God be using this for me to inspect me? Could there be some things about me that need to change? You keep doing what you're doing. What's the adage? You're going to keep getting what you're getting. Let God use it to change you. Number three, write this down. I see rainbows in the storm when I realize God can use storms to correct me. God can use storms to correct me. Important verse I want you to hear, and then I want you to get a principle that's so important, and I don't want you to mishear me here. Hebrews chapter 12, verses 8, 9, and 10. God corrects all of his children. And if he doesn't correct you, then you really don't belong to him. God corrects us for our own good because he wants us to be holy as he is. Now, before we talk about this, let me just say this. You need to understand the difference between correction and punishment. Some people think God is punishing people. That's, the Bible doesn't say that. And correction and punishment are different. You see, punishment looks at the past. You do something wrong, you're going to be punished for it. Correction looks at the future. Here's how you can do it differently. Punishment is past-oriented. It's about guilt. You did wrong, you did bad, so you're being punished. But correction or discipline is future-oriented and says this is the path that's healthier for you to go on. Let's do it different this next time. Here's the thing I want you to get. God doesn't punish his children. The Bible is clear. Punishment was taken by Jesus Christ once and for all. The just for the unjust. Jesus took all of the punishment of all time upon him. No longer do we have to look at God as the great punisher. He is not that. But he does correct us. And when he corrects us, it's like a loving parent who says, look at doing it this way. What you did got you in the ditch. Look at doing it this way. This is the way I want you to be. This is the way I want you to go. The motive for correction in your life is always God's love. If a parent loves their child, how many of your parents? How many of your parents here? How many of you would rather not correct or discipline your kids? We would rather not do that. But because we love our kids, we're willing to, to correct them, to discipline them because we care about them. It is an unloving parent who doesn't correct or discipline. So sometimes there's pain that happens in our life, storms that happen in our lives, and God is saying, let that be a picture in your mind of me correcting you to a better life, a better way. C.S. Lewis said this. It's on the screen. You may want to write it down. God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. God whispers to us in our pleasure, but he shouts to us in our pain. In other words, sometimes when you're in the middle of that storm, you can say, I understand. And it's all your perspective. You're the one who has to put wheels on this thing. You can say, I think I get this. God is correcting me. God is nudging me to a better way of going through life. Maybe it's depending upon him more. Maybe it's trusting him. Maybe your storm is cancer and you're scared to death. I get it. I, that, that makes sense to me. Maybe God is wanting you to say, I don't understand it and I don't know what the future holds, but I am going to learn to trust him by faith. I'm going to learn to walk with him by faith. Live or die. Sink or swim, I'm putting my trust in him. Pain is God's megaphone. Pain is God saying, hello, wake up. Here's a better way for you to be. The Bible says God teaches people through suffering and he uses distress to open their eyes. This says to me problems can be educational. 
God uses our problems or God uses storms as a school. Our difficulties can be the curriculum. God says, I want to educate you through problems. Some of y'all are very educated. I can tell you're very educated because you've been through a lot of problems. But have you learned the lesson that God is trying to get you to learn through your problems? God may want to teach you about an area of weakness or a blind spot. Some of you have a blind spot. I know I've got some blind spots. took me years to figure out what those blind spots are. You know what? I stay away from the blind spots now. Because I know the blind spots lead me into the ditch. I don't want to go into the ditch. But it took God correcting me through storms over a long period of time before I got it. Maybe you're the same. I like this saying, you don't know God is all you need until God's all you got. And sometimes when you go through that real painful time, that's what he's wanting you to understand. You don't know God is all you need until you realize God is all you got. Write this down. What is this problem or storm I'm in teaching me? What is it teaching me? Number four. This is a different kind of a thought, but I think it's true. God uses storms sometimes to protect me. God uses storms to protect me. I've known some people that they, they just see things happening and then they just see why did this happen, why did that happen, and it's only with some distance to look back and say, God was actually protecting me because if I had been doing what I wanted to do and if that storm hadn't slowed me down, I would be in the prison right now. I'd be in the state penitentiary right now, but God allowed storms in my life and those storms protected me. You know what I'm talking about? Any of you relate to that? Any of you can look back and say, wow. I know people who got arrested, little petty arrests, but they got little petty arrest, and it was as if it was happening just so they learned, I'm not going to let you get out of this. You've got to take care of some situations. You've got to get your life on the right track, and I am trying my best to protect you from where you want to go because if you go through this protection stage right here, you move beyond this, then you're going to have a long, difficult, t- t- tough life. God's wanting to protect us. In the Middle East, sometimes shepherds have sheep who just keep wanting to go too close to the edge, too close to the edge. And and I've read many, many accounts of how shepherds gently would break their leg, then put a splint on the little sheep's leg, and then keep the sheep close to them so it couldn't wander off until it learned that it's good to be close to the shepherd. If you get too far from the shepherd, you're going to be prey. The the wild animals are going to come and they're going to kill you or you're going to fall off a cliff. And so shepherds have to do that to teach Stay close. I'm protecting you. I'm protecting you. Some of you might be looking at your storm right now and need to just be honest and say, God is just protecting me. Some of you haven't gotten into that relationship you wanted to get into, and you know what? I think God is protecting you. I think God is protecting you. Because if you had your way, you'd be far down the road, you'd already be in the relationship, and it would be the most difficult, horrible thing you've ever dreamed of. But God protected you. Thank you, God, for that. Genesis 50, 20, Joseph looks at his life and he sees how so many people came after him and so many people tried to hurt him, especially his brothers. And Joseph said this profound thought, you intended to harm me, but God intended it for good. That's a good way to see things. The storm could be getting me down, but I'm realizing the storm was actually God's way of blessing me and protecting me. Now, I'm not saying it's easy to figure out why these things happen. Proverbs 20, 24 says this, Since the Lord is directing our steps, why try to understand everything that happens along the way? That's just the Proverbs writer saying, we don't understand it all, we don't understand why, but I think this is something to hang on to. Sometimes storms can protect us. Write this down. How is this problem or storm I'm in protecting me? How is this storm or problem I am in right now protecting me? It might be protecting you from something far worse that's just around the corner. Fifth and last point is this. Rainbows and the storms. God uses problems or storms to perfect me. God uses problems or storms to perfect me. When I find somebody that's really hitting at a real high level spiritually, 
and they just kind of life for them. They finally have walked into the, themselves. They finally are getting it. They finally, you know what I can tell? They've been through some storms because God has used those storms to create in them a supernatural spirit, something that's not normal, something that is supernatural, something that's not ordinary, but something that truly is extraordinary. To make us into his image. That's his goal. How many of us are just like Jesus now in every way? We just act like Jesus and our hearts are just like Jesus. Anybody here? We're not there yet, are we? But you know what? In storms, God moves us a little bit closer. A little bit closer. I don't know a lot about growing things, produce, vegetation. I know a lot of stuff grows in the spring. I know there's some things that grow in the winter. I know this, though, about us. We grow best in the winter. Write that on your outline. I grow best in the winter. We all do. We all do. Those periods of time when it's sad and life is difficult and we are trying to say, oh God, what is going on? I am so afraid. We are growing by leaps and bounds during times like that. Your greatest spiritual growth will not come on a mountaintop, ever. Your great spiritual growth almost always comes in a valley. Doesn't mean we like the valley, but that's where God is doing his best work. Your greatest spiritual growth does not happen on the sunny summer days when everything is cool and wonderful. And life just seems so grand. I look back, y'all, I look back on my life when it, from the outside it looked so grand and great and I was coasting. And then I look back on my life when Jane remembers a period of my life where I was, I mean, I was, my guts were just being ripped apart every day. But you know what? It was during that time that God was building me into the man he wanted me to be. <coughs> so I look back now and say, that storm that I didn't want to go through, he used it to help perfect me. 2 Corinthians 4, 17, the paraphrase of the message says it like this. These hard times, your hard times, they're small potatoes compared to the coming good times, the lavish celebration that is prepared for us. And I believe that. That fear that you have about that cancer report, it's okay to be afraid. I get it. God, God knows how that would make you nervous. But I want you to know one day you'll understand it's small potatoes compared to what he has prepared for you. It is small potatoes, and I want you to know if you are mature through this, you will learn the lesson you need to learn, not to make the cancer go away. I'm not saying that. You'll learn the lesson so you can look back and say, Wow, through that period of my life, God grew me up a lot. God grew me up a lot. Romans 5, 3 and 4 says this, We can rejoice when we run into problems and we run into trials, for we know that they're good for us. They help us learn to be patient, and patience develops strength of character in us, and it helps us trust God more each time we use it. Let me close with a couple of sentences. Your problem right now is not really your problem. Let me say it again because I don't want you to misunderstand. Your problem right now, your storm right now is not really your problem. Your real problem is how you respond to the problem. Your storm right now is not the big deal in your life. The big deal right now is how you respond to the storm. When does your problem become a real problem? When you begin to respond the wrong way. When you lose God's perspective on it. When you start blaming other people for the problems in your life. When you become bitter. I was with a guy this week and he said, Ray, I am so bitter. I am so bitter. And he is. And I said, man, now's the time. Well, you've got a half a life in front of you. Let's put that bitterness off. Get rid of it. It's not worth it. When you become angry, when you become resentful, when you lose your sense of humor, when you throw away your values, when you say, as I have heard people say even in this church, I'll never forgive them. I'll never forgive them. 
When you open up and you look at your problems and you focus on the problems and you don't look at God, but you look at your problems, you are misusing the opportunity. You are missing the chance. But if you can take a step back and say, what a storm. God, where is the rainbow? How are you trying to direct me? How are you possibly through this trying to correct me? How are you wanting me to use this to inspect me? How, oh how, is this going to perfect me? Then you can see the rainbow in the storm. I've seen this on many of your Facebook pages and I like it. Life isn't about waiting for the storm to pass. Life is about learning to dance in the rain. And it's so. But it's hard to dance until you see the rainbow. And then you can say, I got it. God is teaching me through this horrific thing. God is teaching me. That doesn't mean the pain goes away either. I know some of you have pain. I don't want to leave here without saying, I understand the level of pain. I can only grasp it and imagine the, the greatness of your pain. But I want you to know one day you'll be able to see, one day, a rainbow. And you'll be able to see, I would never want to go through that again. And it was horrible and it wasn't caused by God, it was caused by the enemy and I hated every second of it. But through it, I have learned whatever the lesson was that you have learned. Would you bow your heads please? Our Father in heaven, I thank you for this day. I thank you for allowing us to spend time talking about something that is really the essence of maturity. Lord, we know in this life we will have problems and difficulties and struggles. We know that. But Father, we know during this time you can teach us lessons we need to learn. I pray that you would help us and bless us. And I thank you for this. We pray this in the name of Jesus.